This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. This is not a drill. That's the message of thousands of activists who took to the streets of major cities across the globe Monday to raise the alarm about the climate crisis, gluing themselves to buildings, blocking roads, occupying public landmarks, and being arrested by the hundreds in the first day of a two-week protest led by Extinction Rebellion. The group reports more than 700 activists from Brisbane to New York City have been arrested in just the first day and a half of protests. Nearly 300 were arrested in London after shutting down major streets and taking over 11 sites in the in Westminster. Uh, one group superglued themselves to a parked hearse in Trafalgar Square as hundreds occupied the area. Other demonstrators shut down Westminster Bridge long enough for a couple to get married before the crowd. This is protester Jake Lynch speaking from the streets of London. Well, it's now five months since Parliament declared a climate emergency, and yet we've seen no emergency legislation brought forward to take effective action to stem the climate crisis. So we're still subsidizing fossil fuels more than any other country in Europe. Globally, carbon emissions are still increasing. We're heading in precisely the wrong direction. We here at Extinction Rebellion are taking action to interrupt the flow of normality, because it is that flow that is carrying us towards disaster. Extinction Rebellion launched in London last year and has since grown into a global movement. Prime Minister Boris Johnson attacked the, group, the group's protesters Monday night, calling them uncooperative crusties. Climate activist George Monbiot responded, tweeting, quote, I'm proud to be an uncooperative crusty. Extinction Rebellion continues. Come and see why Boris Johnson hates it so much and how it challenges the life-destroying system he defends. In New York City, nearly 90 activists were arrested after staging a die-in on Wall Street, pouring fake blood on the iconic bull statue outside the New York Stock Exchange. Dozens were also arrested in Amsterdam, Vienna and Madrid. In Brisbane, Australia, an activist hung from Story Bridge in a hammock for six hours. Activists also took to the streets in Chile, Colombia and Mexico. Brazilian protesters held a die-in on Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro. Protesters shut down the street in central Paris near the Notre Dame, and hundreds flooded the streets of Berlin to demand action to combat global warming. This is German climate activist and migrant rescue ship captain Carola Rakit speaking from Berlin. Als Extinction Rebellion fordern wir, dass die Netto As Extinction Rebellion, we demand that net emissions be reduced to zero by 2025 as part of an emergency program, as well as an immediate halt to the loss of biodiversity. What we also demand, and this is the interesting part, is that there be a citizens gathering which votes on the necessary measures. Extinction Rebellion will never make concrete policy proposals. We are saying the issue has to be handed back democratically to the citizens, who then decide on the measures together. Protest continue today in cities around the world. In London, Extinction Rebellion plans to plant at least 800 trees outside of Parliament. For more, we go to London to speak with Extinction Rebellion co-founder Gail Bradbrook. Welcome to Democracy Now! Can you talk about the scope of the protests and, once again, remind us how Extinction Rebellion was founded and got its name? Um, yeah, um, good afternoon, Amy. And um, I just wanted to say what an honour it is to be on Democracy Now! You asked how this started. I think the first thing to say is this movement stands on the shoulders of our elders um, across the world who have been protesting about the environment for many years. And in many countries, that means death. I mean, 200 environmental activists die each year across the world. And um, I would in in include Democracy Now! as one of our elders. Uh, you have many fans in the UK. Um, so thank you for your broadcast over the, these years. You've kept us going, actually, with your truth and um, ability to forward the voice of ordinary people of activists across the world. Uh, we got going because we did quite a lot of research, actually, into social movements. Uh, we looked at social science. Uh, we also looked into our hearts about how we were feeling. And we said that a movement would need to be um, driven both by some techniques called momentum-driven organizing. And we had some training by a fantastic organizer based in the States called Carlos Saavedra uh, from the INI Institute. Um, and we also did a lot of research into people like Gene Sharp, the father of civil resistance 
distance. And we welcomed people to uh, feel how these times are for them. And I think the fuel of grief is uh, important to our movement and the fuel of, of, of fear, in all honesty, because what that means is that people are willing to open their hearts up and feel the love for life on Earth and say, actually, I am not willing to put up with this anymore. I, I guess the, the thing to add to that in a way is, especially for Westerners like myself that sit in a degree of, uh, quite a degree of pri privilege, is that there's something about consumer capitalism that that, that both traumatizes us and then offers us a lot of comforts to stay quiet and silent and to just keep our heads down and keep sort of like slightly stressing about keeping our jobs going and so on. And somehow I think this movement has helped um, break through that mold by welcoming uh, grief and feeling and then encouraging people to get on the streets and take risks with, with the possibility of getting arrested. And Gail Bradbrook, what are the uh, immediate demands uh, of the Extinction Rebellion movement? So we have three demands. The first one is for government and other institutions to tell the truth. And also, in that way, it's not just a lip service by declaring emergencies and then carrying on with business as usual. That also means reversing policies inconsistent with that truth. So stopping immediate harms that are happening. In the UK, what that means, for example, is that we have uh, fracking happening in this country. We're opening up new coal mines. We have the planned expansion of, um, of the railway system, but through what's basically an aviation shuttle service called HS2 that's going to deforest Britain bigger than has happened since World War One. So tell the truth and reverse inconsistent policies. The second demand is for net zero carbon emissions by 2025 and halting biodiversity loss. And the reason we have such a tight target there is that this is definitely and absolutely an emergency. And what we need is for governments to act like it's an emergency. If Britain, again, I know the UK situation more, carries on as it's doing with very, very minor reductions in its emissions. It will have run out of its so-called carbon budget. I don't believe there are any carbon budgets myself, actually, uh, within a few years' time. And they keep missing targets. So this idea we can have a 2050 target is nonsense. The third thing is then, how do you go about seeing these changes? What policies should we have? Should we have carbon budgeting or carbon taxes? Should we um, put pressure on people to stop flying or, or go vegan or whatever? Uh, should we look at the farming community and how they could farm differently? Well, within all of that and loads of great ideas and loads of debate and Extinction Rebellion is very clear. It's not up to us to have a position on any of that within the movement. There'll be lots of opinions and so on and lots of debates. <clears throat> we want a citizens' assembly. It's um, a form of democracy that comes from the older times, from Greek, Greece, from Athens. And it was actually how democracy used to be. It wasn't all about voting by a long way. Most things were done by citizens' juries. So you select um, through a lottery system like a jury uh, dem demographically representative sample of your citizens and they're uh, given critical thinking skills and they are given lots of information by experts and well facilitated and they tend to come up with really good uh, policy solutions and it's a really good way to handle these kinds of issues that frankly our current democracies are just not able to deal with. Well, one of the things you mentioned earlier, consumer capitalism and, and its ability to uh, basically disarm the population in dealing with the, the climate crisis, uh, you've talked about the relationship between the mushrooming debt in the world uh, and the climate crisis. Could you expand on that? So, yeah, I would, what I would say is that in its first iteration, Extinction Rebellion is really about democracy by calling in for these new democratic forms for people to have their power. And frankly, in many countries of the world, democracy is in just absolute shambles. It certainly is in the UK. As people understand that there's an emergency, uh, there's this democracy is not working. There's going to be two directions of travel. One is in the direction of more democracy, and so that means people's assemblies and really understanding how we can work together. And the other is in the direction of less democracy, which is the very great risk of eco-fascism. So that's the focus on democracy. What some of us are looking at, and it's an early um, uh, focus, and as a movement, we, we will write papers and share, uh, uh, share ideas for feedback. But we're talking about how are we going to take on the finance system? So we have an economic system that essentially is 
killing life on Earth. Let's put it that way. It's very simple. You, uh, you, as, as one economist once said, uh, uh, Kenneth Boldin, he said that to expect that you can have um, uh, exponential growth on a finite planet, you either have to be a madman or an economist. And I think increasingly, and I've spoken to members of the elites really recently, to, to investment bankers and so on, people are frightened. And actually, their children are putting a lot of pressure on them. And they know some kind of change has to come. And in Extinction Rebellion, we're generally not, uh, well, I'm not speaking for everybody personally, but as a movement, we're not ideological. We're not taking a position against one kind of economic system or for another. We're saying, basically, this is not working. We need to have a grown-up conversation about what kind of system do we need, both politically and legally and culturally and economically, that will stop this ridiculous, uh, outrageous harming that we're doing to ourselves and the planet. And, and obviously, there's some people absolutely on the front line of the crisis. And it's an intergenerational injustice. And how do we then move into a situation where we can repair the harm that we've done? So what I think we're going to need to move into is a mass debt refusal, where we say we're not going to pay the debts that we have. And some of us with some privilege might take on some debts and actually give the money to, to people at the front line of the crisis. That's the kind of direction I'd like to see us, us move into. Um, Dr. Bradbrook, we played the clip of um, uh, the German climate activist, the migrant rescue ship captain, Carola Rakete, um, who makes that link between immigration and climate. Um, since this is such a key issue all over the world, the issue of migrants and the industrial polluting countries blocking migrants from coming in, can you talk about that link, climate refugees? <clears throat> yeah, and I think this is this issue of eco-fascism. Up to one in ten people will be on the move uh, without wanting to be uh, due to mass uh, droughts, due to places becoming too hot, due to uh, flooding. And the idea that we can sit in our racism and close our borders is simply not going to work for us. Obviously, it's a moral issue. Also, there'll be mass migration within countries. So in the UK, 10 percent of the population will be on the move by 2050. That's the the predictions. Actually, the recent IPCC report, which was about the cryosphere and the ocean sea level rising, yet again said that things were worse than thought and that flooding events that were once every 100 years are going to move into being every single year in many locations. So there's going to be um, mass migration, and that's already happening. We've, we've already seen some of that. And what we need to do is have a very uh, compassionate um, approach to how we tackle that issue and how we look after a planet that is destroying places where you, so that pe they become in, uninhabitable. And obviously the people on that front line as well who are doing the migration tend to be the people that did the least to create this damage. And so we have a moral responsibility to take care of people. I'm very in favour of, and I'd like to see it actually placed in some international demands. Again, the movement needs a conversation about that with the law of ecocide, which is a law that the uh, lawyer Polly Higgins was working on, and she has a team taking it forward. She died, unfortunately, earlier this year, which would put a fifth crime against peace in at the Rome Statutes level, at the UN level. And what that would do would be to criminalise mass damage and destruction of the environment. So many of these damaging um, actions that are happening in indigenous lands and elsewhere created by corporations would literally be criminal. And then secondly, what that law also does is it bakes in the insistence that there's a repair of the harm that happens, which includes uh, compensating people, finding homes for people. And actually, in order to do this repairing of the harm that needs to happen, you've got Sir David King, the former chief uh, scientist of the UK, who's setting up a climate repair centre and saying that, actually, we can't even go to one and a half degrees C. You know, the ice is already melting. We're already over 410 parts per million. What really needs to happen is we have to go into drawdown. We have to be bringing carbon out of the atmosphere. And we can't wait for these magical technologies that are somehow going to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere in the future. I mean, we can do business 
business as usual. And so um, what we have to do, what we're going to need to do is really work with nature to repair the climate. And that's also going to tackle this um, evil twin or evil triplet, you know, of, of biodiversity loss. We've got the evil twin of ocean acidification and how we wreck in our ocean. So all of this has got to be cleaned up. And what that means is we need like a lot of human labor. So humanity has to rise up in a really beautiful way and tend to the damage that we've done. And that needs all of us and it needs all of us together in the places of the earth that's going to sustain life, working together to, to rewild areas, to um, restore ecosystems, to clean up the rivers, to uh, plant trees, uh, you know, to, to basically, you know, sort the plastic outs in the ocean and so on. And I actually think that there's so many beautiful innovations out there and humanity could do that together and it needs all of us. And for me, this is part of reweaving a human family back together again. It's part of dealing with systemic racism, white supremacy and the, and, the, and the wounds of patriarchy that want to separate us, make us feel powerless and, um, you know, destroy our togetherness and I, make us think that, you know, the whole planet's kind of scarce when actually nature is abundant and it, it, it replenishes itself. I'd like to ask you about those who, uh, re your response to those critics who agree with the goals of Extinction Rebellion but, uh, but uh, oppose your tactics. For instance, New England Prime Minister Minister Jacinda Ardern said she supports the right to protest, but, quote, blocking people from being able to go and do their day-to-day -day job doesn't necessarily take us any closer to the climate action for, for that they are calling for. Well, London's mayor, Sadiq Khan, has said something similar. Y your response? Well, when you look at the results of the protests, if you look at the graphs of how much people are talking about the ecological crisis, it absolutely spikes when the protests happen. So there's sort of like two data points here. One is how many people are active in our social movement. And we know from the research of Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan that you need between 1 and 3.4 percent of the population to come together and to be willing to support people to get on the streets and be on the streets themselves. And that, by the way, means that people can be part of Extinction Rebellion without being willing to get arrested, because it's not right for everybody, for many people. Um, they might have care in duties, or we can't guarantee that black people would be treated in the same way as white people and so on. So this is a movement for everybody, this is a, as a space for everybody. Now that doesn't mean that everybody likes our tactics and people don't have to like us in order to start talking about the crisis. What happens if you stand passively uh, by the side of the road with a placard saying, you know, stop climate change is you just get ignored. When you get on the street and block it, people start to have a conversation about this existential situation that we're, hit, we're in. When we say existential threat, what we mean is we're in an apocalyptic situation. You have to use biblical language to talk about what it means to be in a six mass extinction event. And that's the only way to get that information over to people that I understand anyway is to be disruptive. And when people say, well, we agree with your message, but we don't like how you're doing it, my general answer is like, if you've got a better plan, tell us, because literally we've tried all the other stuff right into our MPs and our politicians and doing petitions and going on marches. I don't see what else there is other than getting on the streets. And frankly, as this crisis worsens and, and we face things like food shortages, you know, the, the academic term actually is multi bread basket failure when across the planet either droughts or floods mean that the, the farms can no longer produce enough food. Um, when we're facing that and, 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 and literally people are fighting over tins of beans in the supermarket, people are going to wonder why more of us were on these streets in these times when there is still the possibility of two things. One is making the harm less. The other is, um, you know, starting to repair the, the harm. And the other thing that we have to do is Professor Jen Bendel's um, uh, agenda, which is to, to start to adapt to the uh, conditions that are going to meet us and are going to meet our children in the future. We have to start planning for, for example, the flooding of nuclear power stations and what that means, planning for localising food systems and food crises and that <coughs> kind of thing. Dr. Brabrick, we just have 10 seconds. Your response to your Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, calling you uncooperative crusties. <laughs> Um, I'm sending him a lot of love. He actually met some Extinction Rebellion people recently who sang to him a Teze song about listen to your heart, let love lead the way, and he actually started to cry and to shake. So I don't think anyone's beyond redemption. His, um, his father's a, a, in, interested in ecological crises as well. So we have to reach out to everybody and say join us because you know this is real. Stop messing about, Boris, and get on the streets with us.
Dr. Thank Gail you. Bradbrook, we want to thank you for being with us, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, speaking to us from London, England. When we come back, workers at General Motors have entered their fourth week on strike, longest national strike at GM by the United Auto Workers in almost a half a century. Stay with us.